We are going to look at Jerusalem this evening, and we can get a real sense of it because today the temperature here is exactly the same as the temperature in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the place which is called in Galatians 4, the mother of us all. It's noted in Psalm 87 that Yahweh loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob, and he notes that this one and that that one is born in her in a spiritual sense. It's the city that Daniel prayed towards in his distress, as recorded in Daniel chapter 6. It's the city which Deuteronomy repeatedly says is the place where God chose that he should dwell there. And it's a city that our Lord Jesus Christ visited often and spoke of often. And in Luke chapter 19, we read of the weeping of our Lord as he is outside Jerusalem. We know that verse 28 says he is ascending up to Jerusalem and he instructs his disciples to go and find the the colt tied and to loose him. But verse 41 of Luke 19 says it, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children with thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation they had no concept it's not talking of the city of the bricks and mortar of course but the people within it had no concept that the son of god the messiah the prophesied one was there and he was visiting the city he was inspecting it and found it wanting because verse 45 goes on he he threw out those that had turned his father's house into a den of thieves. But he speaks in verse 42 of the things which belong unto thy peace, but they're hidden from their eyes. But they should not be hidden from our eyes, brothers and sisters. The scriptures instruct us very clearly of the peace of Jerusalem. And part of the name Jerusalem, the last bit, is to do with peace. So let's begin our studies then in Psalm 122, which we just had read. It's one of the the songs of ascents of David. And it speaks there of one who is saying, let us go unto the house of Yahweh. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. And how is Jerusalem described? Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of Yahweh and to the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of Yahweh. The city is compact together, and it is linked with the tribes of Israel, thrice there in verse 4. And that word compact, when we look it up and what it means, it's, it's the same word where you get the idea of friend, the word friend from. And that's why some translate this as a, a, Jerusalem is a city whose fellowship is complete. It's not so much to do with the bricks and the mortar and the stones of Jerusalem, of course. But each time when we think of Jerusalem, we've got to think of the individuals within it. That's what Jesus spoke to. And all the tribes of Israel are mentioned here in verse 4. And just to remind ourselves of this link with the whole tribes of Israel, that word compact there uh, in Exodus 28 uh, is, is used again, but of the joining of the ephod of the high priest. So Exodus 28 I'll just go in at verse 6. It says, They shall make the ephod of gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined. That's the same word as Jerusalem is compact together. It's joined together. Um, And it says, uh, and the two ends thereof, uh, and so it shall be joined together. It repeats it twice in verse 7. And what's the whole context of the ephod, of course? You're putting all the names of the children of Israel on the stone in verse 10, verse 11, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. So we've got all the tribes of Israel linked with this joined piece of work. So the tribes of Israel were not to think of themselves as separate tribes, but as one, one group joined together, as em- emphasized in the ephod. 
And if we were to go elsewhere in, in Exodus, we'd see how that the curtains of the, the tabernacle and the temple were compact together. They were joined together. It's the same Hebrew word. So we are supposed to understand Jerusalem as representative of all God's servants, the tribes, who are in fellowship together, considering themselves together as one, giving thanks unto the name of the Lord. And then we go down to verse 6. Uh, we're told it reads, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. That word pray for the peace of Jerusalem is not, is not the Hebrew. The Hebrew is the word for ask. And that's really important because we find that with reference to Jerusalem in the New Testament. Ask for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, you can understand why it's translated as pray, because when we ask things of our Heavenly Father, we are praying to him. But specifically... We're told there to ask for the peace of Jerusalem. But why should we do that? Is it just to do with we're waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to return and bring righteousness and the peace that follows it, as the scripture says? It, it's not just that. Verse 7 says, Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. What is in the mind of the individual who asks for the peace of Jerusalem? For my brothers and companion sakes i will now say peace be within thee because of the house of yahweh our god i will seek thy good who's good my brothers and my companions that word companions is the same word as a neighbor we're to love our neighbor all the way through the law that's the same word so he's saying the ones who are my brothers, the ones who I love as my neighbor. That's why I want to ask for the peace of Jerusalem, because I know that we're one in the house of Israel. I know that we are part of the living Jerusalem, compact together, having fellowship together, all the tribes of Israel, as it were, as one. And I'm not thinking of myself. I'm thinking of others. What do you think Daniel was praying about in Daniel chapter six when he prayed towards Jerusalem? He's thinking of his brothers and his sisters in Israel and how they would be returned back as God had promised. There's no sense uh, that we, we look forward to the kingdom age only for ourselves. There, that's of course part of it, but because we are part of this wider group and we rejoice together, uh, asking for the peace of Jerusalem, for my brothers and my beloved neighbor's sake, I will seek thy good. That's what we've got to have in our mind when we think about Jerusalem. And there are many places that we could go to that discuss how Jerusalem is revered amongst the minds of God's servants throughout the centuries. But Solomon, at the prayer of the dedication of the temple there, says this. He says to God that thine eyes may be open unto this house day and night upon the place whereof thou hast said that thou wouldst put thy name there to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth toward this place. And at that time, at that great prayer of Solomon, he asked that God would on each occasion Israel would, would would fail him that he would forgive them that he would hear their prayer and forgive them but we're left in no doubt whatsoever that God's name is in Jerusalem and I want to just take an aside rather briefly to, before we get back onto Jerusalem just to remind ourselves of God's name before we focus on how that that is inextricably linked with the meaning of Jerusalem if you were to try and look at many places and find out what Jerusalem says, very often you'll find it saying, oh, I have uncertain derivation, or it might even give you a meaning which has no basis in Hebrew. So what does the scripture say? Let's go back just to remind ourselves. We know that Joshua was once called Oshia, the son of Nun, and God says to him in Numbers 13, I'm going to change your name to Yehoshua. And we know why that is, because his name was changed from the present tense of salvation to being you shall save or he shall save. And that's, of course, picked up in the New Testament when the Lord Jesus Christ's name is referred to. Matthew 1 verse 21, he shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save Yehoshua, his people from their sins. There's no, there's no doubt about it. There's no question. God specifically drew attention to the fact that he wanted people to think of the salvation that he would bring as a future thing. It's something that we look forward to. It is not complete yet. And so Joshua's name change is changed to that. And it is repeated when Jesus' name is given. He shall save his people from their sins. And without going in the full 
uh, derivation of it this time. I'm happy to go through the and send you extra slides if you, if you want to do so. God's name is in the future tense. Uh, it's always translated as, as, uh, as that, actually, um, it, whenever, whenever it's translated uh, in its form, he will be or I will be, uh, except in one place in Exodus, which has confused things. But the point is, God's name, and the, see these the, 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 on the right-hand side there, just so you can be confident in them. I got those translations from a, the PLM website, which is a Hebrew grammar website. It's uh, uh, accessible to all and very highly regarded, so you don't have to worry, am I making mistakes with the grammar? I got those straight from the PLM website. That's why it's got the little red in it, because that's what it does. And that's what it tells you it means, and you can check it for yourself. And that's the case. So Yahweh's name means he will be. Isaac's name. Where's Isaac? Is he here this evening? No. I would have asked him what, it, what his name means, and usually people say laughter. That's not the case. Yitzchak means he will laugh. Uh, Joseph, he's not here, is he? Little Joseph, I'd have asked him as well. Uh, he'd have known, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Little blighter, he would have as well, wouldn't he? Um, it, it's he will add, right? Joseph, right? And Yisrael, when we get to, to, to that name, that's, quite, that's a more difficult one. Again, often we see it's uncertain derivation. It's he will wrestle, right? The Tsar is the prince. That, um, I'll break it down for you here. So before we leave the slide, because I might not be able to go back and forth, point is God's family, and that comes up again with Jerusalem when we go in the New Testament, all have future names. Yahweh, Yitzhak, Yosef, Yisrael, Yehuda, others in the family, that's all future, right? That's what they're looking for. God will be, he will laugh in the kingdom age. God will add uh, Israel. Uh, about future wrestling. So what I'm suggesting to you here is that Israel means he will be a ruler, and that means somebody who wrestles, somebody who's ruler, who's got power over something with God. And that's broken down like this. So the first bit is the Yasar bit, he will be a ruler, or somebody who's got power over something, that's where the wrestle idea comes from, with El, with God at the end. So that's what, that's what Israel means. He will be a ruler, or a prince with God. So just like the family of God have this future emphasis in all their names, just like Jesus did, he will save his people from their sins. Israel, I put it to you, means that as well. That when we look forward to being part of Israel, the tribes of Israel, Psalm 122, we'll be those who will be rulers with God. And we'll look in a moment how that's found exactly as, that, in, as it puts it there in Revelation chapter 5. That's the hope of every believer to reign and rule uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom age. But focusing on our subject this evening, and I recognize we've gone through that quickly, but we, we need to focus on Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 9, for example, emphasizes this. O, o Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Now, I can only find two things in the whole of Scripture that are called by God's name. Now, if you can find another, I'd be delighted to hear it. But I can find only two. One being uh, the people of Israel that we just looked at, and then also the city, which is the capital of Israel. Um, now, that's quite an interesting uh, thing for us to think about. And just to emphasize that, Roman, Revelation chapter 1 tells us, that the hope, the hope that we have is we're going to be made kings, rulers, and priests unto God and his Father. Uh, and to him be glory forever and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's Revelation chapter 1. And Revelation chapter 5 says the same thing. The hope of the believers who are taken out of every blood, kindred, tongue, and people and nation has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the idea of Israel. He will be a prince or a ruler with God. That's Revelation 1, and that's Revelation 5. Having got that reminder then in our heads of what the family of God means, including the Lord Jesus Christ, including what Israel means and the hope that a believer has, let us now then focus on Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem mean? If I was to ask you, what, what are we commonly here? That Jerusalem means what's it very very oftenly often translated as thank you uncle Gordon the city of peace that's completely and utterly incorrect 
and I'm not going to put it up on the slide because once I put it up on the slide and people thought I was saying it meant that and I got all sorts of confused messages. So sorry about that. We're not going to do that. That's what people think it is. But there's no basis for that in, in, in the Hebrew. There it is. Yerushalayim in the Hebrew at the top and uh, in the English at the bottom. What does that mean? Now, we aren't left to our own devices to say, I wonder what it means. Uh, you know, let's, let, we've got to get some Hebrew scholar somewhere to translate it for us. God has told us in Scripture what it means, and it is Scripture that will explain it to us. Where do we go to find where this word comes to? What's the word for peace in, in Hebrew? Shalom. So we can all agree the last bit, shalayim, is a bit different. It sounds like shalom, and it is, but it's a variation on shalom. So we've got the peace. Ask for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. The peace that Jesus spoke of in Luke 19 is there. But you've got this yuru bit at the start. What does that mean? It's from Genesis 22. Now, Genesis 22, um, as we know, is, is the great uh, example of the father offering the son in Abraham and Isaac, mirroring our heavenly father and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know the emphasis here where he is described, Isaac is described as thine only son. It's such a powerful uh, teaching that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis 22. But when these things are done, we just want to look in at verse 14. Right. So actually, we should just go back. We know that we are in the place of Jerusalem because verse two says, and he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of Moriah. So this is Mount Moriah, which we know is also one of the names of Jerusalem. Zion is another one, but this is the area we're talking about. And how does Abraham speak of these things? Verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place, which we now call Jerusalem, Moriah or Zion, or it was called Salem before that. We'll come to that later. What does he call it? Jehovah Jireh, or in the Hebrew, Yahweh Yireh. Now, if we look at our margins, what does it say it means? What did Abraham say that place meant? Yahweh will see. Yahweh will see. Yireh. Yahweh will see. And so I put it to you, the scriptures tell us at that occurrence, that great time when Abraham was there with Isaac and that great act of faith, which is recorded in the New Testament for, for us, it's as if he did it. The place was called Yahweh will see. The yir -er bit is we'll see. And that's what I suggest is the start here. The yir -er bit is to, to do with the see bit. So let's just pick this apart. So those are the two bits, the yir -er and the shalayim bit. Right, so Genesis 22, verse 14. Again, I've gone to the PLM website. That's how they conjugate uh, the, the verb that we're looking at. And quite clearly, the language, which is Genesis 22, year air, means he or it will see. Right? So how does that help us understand Jerusalem? So what we're saying is, is that there's this first bit at the start, and then you've got the peace bit at the end. So we're, we're saying that Genesis 22 is saying that the first bit is to do with future seeing. He will see. And then you've got this piece, uh, this piece bit at the end. But, as we'll show in a moment, actually I don't know whether I've got the slides, so you'll have to, don't take my word for it, go and look it for yourself. You'll notice that Yeru is not the same as Yire. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, that's fair to say. That's because it's conjugated to now be plural. So instead of it being Yerushalayim, it's Yerushalayim because it's plural. So what I'm suggesting to you is the Yeru means now not he shall see peace, but they shall see peace. It's pluralized. Yerushalayim. Right? So that's the suggestion. Bear with me because we're going to build this up. So the first bit is straight from Genesis 22 and Mount Moriah, but it's the place where he will see. Now it's pluralized to they will see peace, but it's not just peace. Notice what I put at the end there? Don't know whether you can see it. It's called a dual form. In Hebrew, you've got singular, plural, but also you have in the middle a dual form, which just means two. It would what we would call a pair. So in Hebrew, you have a regel, which is a foot. Regelayim is two feet. It's the yim. 
So, you know, when you hear the word im, like the kibbutz im, the kibbutzes in Israel, that's im. But when it's a yim, it's, it's dual. So I'm going to move. Can I move from here? Or am I going to mess up? Yeah. Okay. So it's not im, it's yim. That's the dual plural bit there. Right. Um, so what we're saying is that there's something about the piece which is dual. Now, I learned a very valuable lesson when I was discussing this with brothers and sisters in Germany, because one brother very rightly said, he said, look, uh, if you've got some knowledge of Hebrew, people can understand what you're saying. But if you don't, then people just think you could be making this all up. And, ha and how do they have confidence? It's a very good point. So he found this for me. Just overnight, before we did the next day's talks, he found this article and many others besides, which I thought was very helpful. So, uh, right. So I'm going I'm to go back. Here's an article in the Jewish Journal which recognizes that there are two Jerusalems, that Jew Jerusalem is written in a dual form. And he's asked the question, why are there two Jerusalems? He doesn't know the answer. But all I want to get across to you that it is well known that Jerusalem is written in a dual form. I haven't made it up. Right? So what I'm suggesting to you is that there's a great uh, purpose to it. And if I am going to go back, I hope that doesn't mess up. Oh, I actually can't. Okay. So, um, yeah, I probably can. All right, here we are. I've suggested to you that what it means is dual peace shall be seen. Now, again, you think this is totally enigmatic. What's going on, right? But the scriptures explain it. But we've got the Yerubit from Genesis 22. They will see peace, but not just peace, dual peace. Dual peace shall be seen. Now, remember, this is a really important place because God loves the gates of Zion above all the dwellings of Jacob. Zechariah says, it's the apple of mine eye, the pupil of mine eye. And if God names something, it's going to be important. Just as Jesus' name was changed as important, so is Jerusalem's name. What does it all mean? Jewel peace shall be seen. Now, if only there was a place in Scripture that explained it to us. And we have it in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, the context of it is building God's house, building God's temple. So, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, it's, it talks about the, uh, the Gentiles, verse 11, who were once strangers from the commonwealth of Israel, but have now come in. And we're going to look at that in a second. But what's the context? Verse 20, they are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together for an habitation of the Spirit. Context is building God's house. That's Jerusalem. It's the same language as Psalm 122 and other places we could go to. So in that context, we have two groups of people that are three times emphasized. And here they are. Verse 14, uh, sorry, we need to go in at verse, uh, verse probably 12. It talks about those who were strangers from the covenants of province having no hope. Those are the Gentiles in verse 11. So there's the groups that are the Jews and the Gentiles. Verse 14, for he is our peace. That's the peace bit of Jerusalem. Who hath made both one. Oh, there's two groups who Jew and Gentile are now one and hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man, so making peace. Second time, it says, two are now one, and that makes peace. And then verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Two, now one. And what does it make? Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh. So that whole section, I believe, teaches us what the whole point of the dual peace is. They shall see dual peace. Who? Both Jew and Gentile, the only two groups that are really important in all Scripture. Are we part of God's household, or are we not? Now, this is talking about natural Israel and spiritual Israel. doesn't matter which group you come from. If you've taken hold of the hope of Israel, you're now one. Verse 14 both are made one, and that makes peace. Verse 15, the twain are now one new man, and so making peace. Verse 16, both are now one body, and that causes the peace to be preached. Verse 17, and so we both have access, says verse 18, uh, uh, by one spirit unto the Father. So you see the whole point? That's Psalm 122. 
When you and I think of the kingdom age and how lovely it would be to be there, we have to say, that's because for the sake of my brothers and my neighbours and my brothers and sisters, some of whom I've never met in different corners of the land and the others who have been fallen asleep centuries or millennia ago, that is what is in my mind. And that's what I have to develop because now I understand that God's called that place, the place where dual peace shall be seen. They shall see it. Who? The two, pe- the two groups, the Jew and Gentile, who are made one in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful uh, instruction we have here. And I've tried to um, just summarize that um, with just this, this at the bottom here. And you can see it on the slides how um, Ephesians makes these points. Now, but before I leave Ephesians, I just want to make that link. Remember we said earlier about the idea of um, ask, ask for the peace of Jerusalem? Well, that's here in Ephesians. So in Ephesians chapter 3, it goes through the whole detail. Uh, Verse 15, or verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Which family? The family we just looked at. The family of Jerusalem. The family where it's Yahweh and Yehoshua, and Yisrael, and Yosef, and Yehuda, and all of the ones who carry the name of God, the future context. The context here is building, chapter 2, verse 21, God's household. Those are the same people who are the family of God. They're carrying the name of God. That's you and I, brothers and sisters. And then it says in verse 20 of Ephesians 3, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us and to him be glory in the ecclesia by christ jesus throughout all ages will without end amen that's psalm 122 verse 6 ask for the peace of jerusalem why because the peace of jerusalem is to ask about the ecclesia in jesus christ that's what jerusalem represents isn't it the ecclesia in the wilderness the called out ones Um, as it means in both the Hebrew and you can find a reference to it, obviously in the the Greek and in the Hebrew, the called out ones, the group that have chosen God's heritage, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. Psalm 122, verse 6. So just to summarize where we've got to, there's Yahweh, who's the father, and he's represented by Abraham in the family there. He will be. There's Jesus, who he will save. That's his name. And that's Isaac in the family of Israel. He will laugh. There's Israel. He will rule with God. And he is aligned with Jacob, who's described repeatedly as the multitude. That's you and I. So there's the family of God. Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 15. Of the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There's you and I. The jewel piece shall be seen by Jew and Gentile. And Daniel, in Daniel 9, when he makes that point, he says, look, thy city and thy people are called by thy name. It's all one message. We have to understand that the people of Jerusalem are the Jews and Gentiles who are part of this family. Where there is a father, he will be. The son, he who will save. And we're part of Israel. Those who will rule with God in the kingdom age. Revelation 1 and Revelation 5. That is the wonderful story of Jerusalem. But we're going to look at something slightly different now. And I I find this absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to try and uh, make sure you find it fascinating as well. But I guess you can let me know afterwards. Jerusalem's spelling is really, really interesting in the Bible. We've just summarized what we're saying Jerusalem means. The city where dual peace shall be seen. That's the Jew and Gentile coming together in Christ Jesus as the family of God. But it's spelling is most intriguing. So, if you were to go to Jerusalem today, this is one I took in February, this is the town hall in in Jerusalem, it's spelled the same as we had on our chart, right? Exactly the same. Yerushalayim. But there's a problem. Because as our chart shows, I can find 640 plus times where it's spelled this way instead. Can you see the spelling's different? What's missing between this and that? Yeah, the little yod bit, which changes it for the dual plural. 
So you've got to ask the question, why when you go all over Jerusalem, including on the town hall and even on the manhole covers, do they use this spelling? Yerushalayim, which is what we just explained on our chart. That's used everywhere. But the vast majority of the time, the spelling is different in the Hebrew Bible. It's missing the yod. Why would that be the case? And let me show you this. This is a 2,000-year-old inscription that they just recently found. This was back in 2018. And they found the ancient writing of Jerusalem. And uh, it is Yerushalayim, right? So I'm going, to read, I'm going to read this for you to see what it, so you can, you can get the gist of it. When modern Hebrew speakers talk or write about Jerusalem, they refer to it as Yerushalayim. But in ancient times, a shorthand spelling was often used, Yerushalayim. In fact, 660 times that Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible, only five of them used this spelling. And archaeologists were surprised to find the drums inscription read Hananiah, the son of Dadalos of Jerusalem. So they find that 2,000 years ago, the spelling of Jerusalem is this unusual time. The f only five times is it spelled the Yerushalayim, which is the word we looked at, which we explained. Most of the other times, 600, I can't find 660, I don't know where they get that number from. But well over 600 times, it's uh, Yerushalayim. Now, why would that be the case? So I'm going to put up for you. I would do this in a workshop format, but I don't know whether we've got time. Maybe we could try it. Uh, maybe we could, it's hot evening, isn't it? Right? These are the five occurrences where the Hebrew word of Jerusalem is spelt differently. It's spelt like Yerushalayim, right? With the dual form, as opposed to the 660 times where it's Jerusalem without that form. Just to remind you, this is the form that is used in Jerusalem all over Israel today. And it was used, as this inscription that we just saw, uh, was used 2,000 years ago as well. So it's really interesting. Uh, I think not just words are important in God's scripture, but also spelling. We've already seen that once, remember? When Oshia's name was changed to Yehoshua, just one letter different, major difference in its meaning. Same with Jerusalem. So these are the five occurrences. And I'm going to suggest to you what this is all about and I think there's a wonderful story that goes through Jerusalem right what does it mean right so 1, 1 Chronicles chapter 3 verse 5 so I'm going to turn it up but it's up on our chart what's 1 Chronicles chapter 3 telling us about it tells us there in verse 1 now these were the sons of David which were born unto him in Hebron the firstborn Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitis, the second Daniel of Abigail the Carmelitis, the third Absalom, the son of Maacha, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, the fourth Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And here it is. We're looking um, just, uh, just a little bit further down. I'm going to skip down to verse 5. And these were born unto him in Jerusalem. So it's given all of the places where David's children were born, this is the first time where Jerusalem is spelt Yerushalayim, of these unusual occurrences. Who were born unto David in Jerusalem? Well, Shimea and Shobab and Nathan and Solomon four of Bathsheba, the daughter of Amiel. Would anyone like to just suggest, we're all friends here, what might be the significance of that verse? That in all the times before, Jerusalem is spelt differently, but this is the first occurrence where it's got this unusual spelling, which is most widely used today. What's that verse talking about, do you think? Who's in that verse? Nathan? Nathan and Solomon. Nathan and Solomon. Why are those two men so important? Because we find those two men in the Lord Jesus Christ's record of his genealogy. In Luke chapter 3, Nathan is described in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1, Solomon is described in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two men were born in Yerushalayim. Not Jerusalem now, because they are to do with the family of Christ. And so we're suggesting that this has all to do with building the house of David, which would lead to he, for whom it is said, salvation is of the Jews. Right? So it starts off the first time it ever comes, that spelling, Nathan 
and Solomon were born there. You look at Jesus' genealogy, they're the ones who in each one show, show that Jesus' uh, line comes straight back from David's building of that time, according to the will of God in Jerusalem. Right, next one. 2 Chronicles 25, uh, verse 1. I'll turn it up again if you don't want to. I'm sorry it's not very big on the screen. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Oh, so now we've got two times Jerusalem is spelt. And do you know what the weird thing is in this verse? In the first time it says the word Jerusalem, 29 years in Jerusalem, that's the normal spelling. But when it mentions Jehoadan of Jerusalem, that's Jerusalem, the dual form of the spelling of the word. Now that's Joash's wife. Anybody got any thoughts as to what we might think is important here? Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Well, this is what I suggest to you. If we go back to uh, 2 Chronicles 24, verses 8 to 14, when Jehoadan was uh, queen, what was happening in Jerusalem? 2 Chronicles 24, I'm going to read, uh, going at verse 8. And at the king's commandment, they made a chest and set it without a gate in the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced, and they brought in the cast into the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to its place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord. And what did they do with all that money? They hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as wrought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them. And they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king to Jehoiada, whereof they made vessels for the house of the Lord. Right? So what happens at the time when this woman, Jehoadan of Jerusalem, is reigning with her husband? Jerusalem is built. Another example where Jerusalem is crucially mended. Mended by, look at the list, the masons, the carpenters, those that wrought iron and brass. The workmen wrought the work and it was perfected by them. So there is a theme building up with the use of this unusual spelling of Jerusalem. Next one, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 9. I'm going to flip over and turn it up for you. But uh, what does it say there? After this did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem. There's the dual form, the Yerushalayim. And what does he do? And all his power with him, it says, and unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, and unto all Judah that were at Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Whereon do ye trust that ye abide in the siege of Jerusalem? So what happens at this point in history? 2 Chronicles 32, verse 5. It tells us there, The king strengthened himself and built up the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. Hezekiah, king of Judah, is the next king in the line where Jerusalem is spelt differently, who builds Jerusalem. He strengthens that which was broken down. He raised up the towers and another wall would out. He repaired Millo and made darts and shields in abundance. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me sounds like a very clear theme in the use of the word. But we can discuss it afterwards. Jeremiah 26, verse 18. When Micah the Morishthite is prophesying in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So at the same time period, it tells us there the, the opposite thing. We've had Jerusalem builded, builded, builded. Now, at the same time as Hezekiah is building, Jeremiah 26 says, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Zion shall be ploughed like a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. So in this spelling of Jerusalem, there it is, ploughed as a field, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, shall become like heaps. Why should that be the case? We know that happened, of course. We use that in our public lectures, don't we? That this is a prophecy of Jerusalem being ploughed as a field 
and it was done so by Emperor Hadrian, and he even minted coins showing that very thing after the Bar Kokhba revolt. So we know that happened. But don't you think that's interesting that the first three times Yerushalayim, the special spelling is used, it's talking about building Jerusalem, building the house of Jesus, uh, uh, and, and strengthening that which was broken down. But then Jeremiah says the same time at Hezekiah, but it's going to be broken down. And there'll be a terrible destruction in Jerusalem. Last one is Esther chapter 2, verse 6. And this one is a bit more of a challenge, I would suggest, to uh, elucidate what's being spoken of here. And what does it say in Esther chapter 2 and verse 6? It's talking about, obviously, when the, Lord, uh, when the Israelites were in captivity. It tells us there, now at Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew, his name was Mordecai, who had been carried away from Jerusalem. There it is, the last time it's spelled, Jerusalem, with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. It doesn't tell us anything about building or knocking down there. But if we go to the parallel king's record, it does. It tells us there, what did, what did the, 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 the king do when he carried things away? It says, he carried thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and carried away all Jerusalem. Who? All the craftsmen and the smiths. None of them remained. And the craftsmen and the smiths, a thousand. Even them, the king of Babylon, brought captive to Jerusalem. So what we've got... I put it to you, is that the whole story of Jerusalem has been left on record for us by the times that God spelt it differently. Jerusalem was to be built and built because it had been broken down again and built again. But at the same time it was built, it was prophesied that it would be knocked down and then it was taken away and knocked down by the Babylonians. And so Jerusalem itself, that city which we have to pay great attention to, has had such an up-and-down history. It begins with Melchizedek, who's king of Salem, king of peace. Then it changed to Moriah and Yahweh Yireh in Genesis 22. We looked at that. By the time we get to Joshua chapter 10, that's the first time it's called Jerusalem. In 1 Chronicles 11, it says Jerusalem is called Jebus, which means trodden down. Right? Why is that important? Because that's picked up in the New Testament. Jebus is the place it was trodden down. But between that, David and Solomon, that's when Jerusalem was at peace again. And it was an image of the kingdom. But by the time we get to the Gentile times, Jerusalem has become back to Jebus again. The trodden down place is not God's place anymore. And we're looking then to the last phase of Jerusalem. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the, the scriptures are saying we've got to see in Jerusalem the whole history of the nation of Israel, how that they were built and God was merciful to them, but they turned back and they were knocked down again. But God helped them again and they turned back again. And there was the prophecies that these things should come to pass. And we look for the last turning of this. Ezekiel says, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. Now we've seen the great overturnings of Jerusalem in Scripture. And God, as I believe, left on record even, even the spelling of the name of Jerusalem. Uh, that wonderful message. That that's what we've got to understand. That though God's people were uh, overturned and were trodden down, yet God will build again. It has had such a checkered history. But that's God's witness. That he's there. And what will he do? He will again bring peace in the end so that he, we shall see peace. That's the point that we've got to look up to. And individually, when we think, brothers and sisters, of the point that we started with in Psalm 122, it's this. We are like Jerusalem. We are like the city which is built and then we are knocked down again individually in our lives and we're built again and we're knocked down again. But the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the will of God, has the power to raise us up forever. That we will be forever built as the house of God in the kingdom age. And that is the parable of Jerusalem. That though the Gentiles might tread it down and that though men might turn back on God's ways, God will bring about his plan of peace for all the earth. And that you and I will be there. With the Lord Jesus Christ reigning in that great day. Revelation chapter 3, the Lord Jesus Christ promised this to his servants. 
Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Seen that in Ephesians chapter 2. We're named after the whole family of God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him my new name. Brothers and sisters, that's where we've got to pay attention to what Jerusalem means and the whole parable of it through all of Scripture. Because in the kingdom age, God says, you'll be part of my family and you'll have my family name upon you. And the name of my city, which I also put my name on, will be upon you, New Jerusalem. That's the blessing you're looking forward to. And what is the, what is the New Jerusalem? What is the name that we look forward to? Isaiah 62. Let's, let's turn that up before we bring our thoughts to a close. If you're hot, I'm a lot hotter. I can tell you that right now. what it says in Isaiah 62 for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth is that how you feel that I will not rest I ask I pray for the peace of Jerusalem why for the sake of my brothers and my neighbors my brothers and sisters for all the distress that they're in and all the hope that will be theirs when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. That's why I want the peace of Jerusalem. That's where my mindset is. Because what does Isaiah 62 say, verse 2? The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the clings thy glory. Right? That's the dual form, Yerushalayim. They both shall see peace. Who? The Jews and the Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 2. Think about it. Why would it be the case that in Isaiah 62, when it talks about the peace that Jerusalem should come, the first thing that's mentioned is the Gentiles, those who were not of Israel, far off from the commonwealth of Israel, brought nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that though the Gentiles, with the Jews then, receive what, says verse 2? A new name, which the mouth of Yahweh shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of Yahweh and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt be no more termed forsaken. Is that how we feel, brothers and sisters, sometimes? So some of our brothers and sisters must be in distress in different places. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah and thy land Beulah. Hephzibah, Yahweh delighteth in thee. Beulah and thy land shall be married. Right, so that's what we've got to look forward to, brothers and sisters. This vision in Isaiah 62, when both Jew and Gentile will be there and there will be peace in Jerusalem and God will look upon us and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will look upon us and say to us, I delight in you. You're part of my family. I promised that if you were overcoming, that's the, that's the word in Revelation chapter 3. If I found you trying to overcome, when I come back, I'm going to put you in, in my family. You're going to have my family name upon you. And the name of New Jerusalem, I'm going to say unto you, I delight in you. And that's the hope, of course. We know that, that natural Israel will be revived and be given great blessing in the kingdom age. But spiritual Israel, Jew and Gentile, brought together there in a most wonderful vision of the kingdom age. The Gentiles shall see Yerushalayim. They shall see dual peace or double peace. The whole point of Jerusalem is there in Isaiah 62. That's what we look forward to. The ones who are redeemed. Now, I want to finish with one more um, point that we can leave for discussion in Bible, Bible class. right? Um, because... If I'm going to skip that, if you look at uh, J.B. Jackson's book of scr scriptural proper names, really, really, really good book. He's got Jerusalem literally means about double peace, which I, th I think we've been through. But he also says dual peace should be taught, right? Because that's that you, you can translate Yerushalayim in the same way. Now, I'm wondering to you, I'm going to suggest to you, I'm wondering uh, whether that's also another meaning of Jerusalem. Can it be possible that Jerusalem has two meanings? I'm going, to, I'm going to stop after this, but I want to throw this open because I'm genuinely interested in what you have to say uh, in discussion. Dual peace shall be taught. Where would that come from? Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2 talks about in the kingdom age where uh, we know that the law will flow out from Zion 
and the top of the mountain shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach. That's what uh, uh, Mr. Jackson has suggested Jerusalem means. That it, it, peace will be taught. He will teach us of his ways, and we'll walk in his ways. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So uh, my suggestion to you is, is it possible... That Yerushalayim can mean two things. One for the household of believers and the other for those in the kingdom age who have yet to take on the hope of Israel. Meaning Yerushalayim can mean they will see peace, the ones who have taken hold of the family name of God, and they'll be there with the name and the new name of Jerusalem upon themselves uh, in glory. And at the same time, Jerusalem can also mean, it's the same spelling, those who will be taught of the peace. And so can it mean that Jerusalem also means for these people, because they can't take part in that glory yet, they've got to be taught first before they decide to, that he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. But either way, brothers and sisters, the point is clear, that Jerusalem represents an immense hope for us all. And back in Psalm 122, we've got to ask ourselves, I'm going to finish with this, how often do we mention Jerusalem in our prayers Think of Jerusalem as Daniel did. Look towards Jerusalem in our mind's eye. And in doing so, recognize that I have to see myself as Jerusalem, a city that is full of fellowship, complete fellowship with all the tribes of Israel, my brothers and sisters. And that when I pray about it, I do so for my brothers and my neighbor's sake. That's why I'm praying for the peace of Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus Christ may bring their peace and their good in that great day.